All right. So. All right, so I did want to talk a little bit about converting between radians and degrees. Not because I don't think that we get it, but I think because some people were maybe, I think there's a little bit of uh, anxiety about if I don't do it exactly the way she teaches it in class that I'm not going to get credit for it. So I just want to clarify a couple things, okay? We'll do one sort of example about like what is considered a similar enough method that it's okay and what would be considered like not the same method. All right. So um, in converting between radians and degrees, when we talked about this on Monday, I said, hey, there's this formula where you have like your angle in degrees and you put it over 180 and then you put your angle in radians over pi. Right. And so this is sort of the method that I showed in class, but I spoke with a few other people and they were like, you know, in high school, I kind of learned it a different way. And so another method might be that if you want to find your angle in radians that you do your angle in degrees times pi over 180. Does that look familiar to folks? Okay. Um, so some people have said, okay, well, I just, if I have the angle in degrees, I multiply it by pi over 180 and I get the angle in radians. And that's true. Okay. The other way that people find the angle in degrees is they say pi radians times 180 over pi, okay? So this will actually give you your angles in degrees and in radians, okay? So there's nothing wrong with doing this method. This method and this method are actually the same method. Okay, they're the same method. So what the reason why I don't really teach this second one, though you're 100% welcome to use it, is because some students are like, I never remember, do I multiply by pi over 180 or do I multiply by 180 over pi? And they're trying to sort of memorize the formula. If you're a good memorizer and this way makes sense to you, you are more than welcome to use method number two. If you're maybe a little bit less into memorizing, this one formula up here that we covered on, uh, on Monday will 100% get you to the same place, okay? It's one formula versus two, your choice which ones you use, all right? Does that kind of clarify maybe like some conversations that have been happening around converting between radians and degrees. Okay, so if you use either one of these methods, you're totally good to go, okay? Yeah, and so I think for different people, they're sticky for different reasons. Some people like to have, if I have the degrees, here's how I find the radians, and as a separate rule, if I have the radians, here's how to find the degrees. And I'm kind of more like, let me just put it all into one formula, all right? But either one of those is okay. Um, but to kind of talk a little bit about what is a, what would be considered maybe not the same method, let's just take a very, very quick look at a question that was on your final exam, okay? So there was this question um, for some of you, but everyone had a parabola that they had to graph and find all the key points for. And so the method that we learned in class is that we complete the square. Okay, so moving everything else to the other side, completing the square on this side. And getting getting something like this, okay? This is the way that we learned how to do this in class, 
okay? This is what I expected to see on the final exam. Some people sort of completed the square in like the steps look kind of different along the way a little bit. And to some extent, there's a little bit of wiggle room in terms of the order in which you do things. But things that are not among the things that we ever talked about in class are taking this equation and solving for x. And so I saw some people who were like 8x equals negative y squared minus 4y plus 4. They didn't even show that step. They went straight to here and then started plugging things into all kinds of weird formulas that we have 100% ever talked about in class, okay? To me, these two methods are so different that my first question is, where did you get this method? Because it is not how we learned it. It's not how you showed me the first time you knew how to do it. Seems like a bit of a red flag to me, okay? So when I say like, yes, I want us to use methods learned in class, I'm really trying to look at like, variations on a method are okay. So I'm not saying that like the only way you can do it is the only way we see it in class, but if it's so far out of the vein of how we've ever learned it ever, ever, that is a red flag, okay? So I just wanna kind of clarify that a little bit. I don't mean you have to do everything exactly the way we do it in class, but a lot of these skills, like being able to complete the square like we did on the left-hand side is actually a skill we'll use over and over again. So that is something I want us to feel comfortable with. Whereas this other formula on the right-hand side might work for this particular problem, but then that means that you have to memorize like 50 different equations for 50 different types of problems, okay? So what we're trying to build here is a bigger wheelhouse of skills, not how well can I do research on the internet to help me solve the problem, okay? I hope that makes my point clear. All right, so that being said, let's jump into 5.4. Now I already see a lot of conversation in the chat about right triangle trig stuff. And yes, this is where we are going to begin our journey. Okay. So section 5.4 is about right triangle trigonometry. And at some point in your mathematical career, you have probably heard this phrase, Sokotoa. And I feel like if I ask anyone, they're like, have you ever heard of Sokotoa? They're like, yes, 100% I've heard of it. What does it stand for? People are like, I don't know, something about triangles, maybe, I don't know. And so our goal is to really solidify, like, what is this phrase and like, why does it even matter? Okay. So let's take a look at a triangle. Okay. So we're going to start with a triangle. Um, I like to draw the triangles in a variety of different orientations. So sometimes they'll be sort of pointing up, sometimes they'll be pointing to the right, sometimes pointing to the left. Um, but the goal of that is really to help us learn about perspective, okay? So we've got a right triangle here. And this is the first thing that I want us to notice, is that when we're talking about Sokotoa, you 100% better have a right triangle, okay? If you do not have a right triangle, then all this stuff that we're gonna learn needs to be modified. We can't just take it as it is, okay? All right, so um, we're gonna take a look at this right triangle and we're gonna pick an angle in here and let's call this uh, angle A and then B and then C, okay? So usually when we label a triangle, we label the vertices or the corners with capital letters. And then that means that the sides that are opposite from them, we refer to with the lowercase letter, okay? So if I take a look at angle A, which side is opposite angle A?
Uh, not which angle, which side? Like the top side, the diagonal side, the left side. Okay, the side that goes between C and D, yeah. So we would label this top side as lowercase a, okay? So uppercase a is the angle, lowercase a is the side that is opposite from that angle, okay? Um, where should I put lowercase b? Yeah, we're gonna put lowercase b on the left-hand side because that's opposite of our capital B. And I'm gonna say not quite to that statement, okay? The one across from 90 degrees will always be C is not true. I could label it differently and then it wouldn't be C anymore, okay? We really wanna be careful about that. A lot of times it is, but not all of the time. Right, and in this case it is. We have a capital C and then we have our lower case, right? Okay, so I'm gonna pick an angle. Let's say we're gonna pick angle B, okay? So for angle B, if I asked us to find the sine of angle B, what would we get? Mm, okay. So, Ryan, you are correct. We would get B over C. All right. What about cosine of B? What would we get if we were looking for cosine of B? A over C, good. And what would we get if we were looking for tangent of B? B over A, okay. So yes, I, Eric, I did not forget about you. I was trying to, I was actually right about to wrap it up back to your question, which is what do these words mean, right? So let's go back to, um, to this idea of S-O-H-C-A-H-T-O-A, -H -H right? So each of these is an acronym, meaning that each letter stands for a word. And so if you take a look at the first three, we have S-O-H. And here's what that stands for. We're gonna write this in the first box underneath the main trig functions. So we're gonna write S-I-N theta, okay? So S-I-N is, stands for sine, and sine theta is, let's see, O, H are the letters after S. O stands for opposite. And H stands for hypotenuse, okay? So let's go back to our diagram and take a look. If I have angle B, which side is opposite of angle B? Well, I think we'd say that little b is opposite of angle B. Okay. And then is A my hypotenuse or is C my hypotenuse? Well, I think we'd agree that C is our hypotenuse. And so when we say find sine of b, it really means take the opposite side and divide it by the hypotenuse, or b over c, okay? Now let's take a look at these second three letters, c-a-h. 
The C stands for cosine. And we abbreviate cosine as COS theta, okay, because we got to talk about an angle. Now, this says CAH. The H stands for the hypotenuse. But what does the A stand for? Yeah, the A stands for the adjacent side, okay? So when we look at cosine, we're really looking at the adjacent side as a ratio to the hypotenuse, okay? So, so far we have SOH, C-A-H, and all we've done is just use the first letter in each of those. So S-O-H, that corresponds to the first part of this fancy phrase. Okay. C-A-H. Well, that corresponds to CAH. And now we have to write the last one, which is TOA, right? So T stands for tangent. And we abbreviate that TAN theta equals O or opposite over A or adjacent. Okay. Ah. Uh. Um, Eric, I feel like you ask all the best questions. Can we answer that question in like five minutes? All right. So we have these three main trig functions. So when we think about this phrase, Sokotoa, or that other phrase that you all were saying, which kind of makes me feel gross. <laughs> I'm not going to say it on the video. Um, if you're looking at Sokotoa, Yes, it's a fun phrase, it's a catchy phrase, but what it really stands for is it's meant to help us remember these three main trig functions, okay? So we have sine, we have cosine, we have tangent. Now, if we take a look back at this original triangle, I'm wondering if we sort of shift our perspective for a moment and I say, hey, I want us to find not sine of b and cosine of b and tangent of b, but I'd actually like us to find sine and cosine and tangent of a, right? So sine a, cosine a, and tangent a, okay? Are my answers going to be the same as my sine, cosine, and tangent for B or different? Okay. What's going to be different? Okay. This C is still going to be the hypothesis. All right, but I love what Thea and Eric are saying that A is now the opposite side for little a, for big A, and B is now the adjacent side for big A. And so when we plug in the different sides now, sine of A is the opposite, which is little a, over the hypotenuse, which is little c. That's different than sine of B, right? 
cosine of A is going to be adjacent or little b over hypotenuse, which is little c. And then tangent of A is going to be opposite, which is little a over adjacent, which is little b. Okay? And so what we can see here is that it all depends on what angle you are asking about. Depending on the angle, your answers will vary, okay? But it all is actually the same because we're looking for opposite sides, adjacent sides, and the hypotenuse, right? So, just a little introduction, thinking about what we know, sine, cosine, tangent, right? Now that's pretty much what you learn in high school. You get these three trig functions and someone's like, yeah, just remember Sokotoa, that's it. But what I wanna do is dive a little bit deeper, yay, about what sine, cosine, and tangent really tell us, okay? So here's a definition I pulled from the interweb. In mathematics, sine is a trigonometric function of an angle. The sine of an acute angle is defined in the context of a right triangle. For a specific angle, it is the ratio of the length of the side that is opposite that angle to the length of the longest side of the triangle. And it's really this last phrase here that I'm interested in. For a specific angle, it is the ratio of the length of the side that is opposite that angle to the length of the longest side of the triangle. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that when you use your calculator to find sine, cosine, tangent, and it spits out a number, like, how do they know what number to spit out? Okay. So let's take a look at some triangles. Right? So we'll take a look at these triangles. We've got uh, hand-drawn triangles here by yours truly. Uh, we have the small pink one. We have a medium-sized Thank you. We have a medium sized purple triangle and a larger blue triangle. Okay. And so when we look at these triangles, um, what if I told you that these two sides were the same in the purple triangle? Anybody remember the name for that kind of triangle? What is a family? What's the name of the triangle? Yeah, yeah, it is an isosceles. Look at all those spellings that are so perfect. Yeah, so this is an isosceles. And specifically in our case, it's also a right triangle. But all that means is that it has two equal sides, side length. We, what language is isosceles? English. <laughs> All right, thanks, Brian. Okay, so let's say that this side length was uh, five and this side length was five. Uh, anybody happen to know how long the hypotenuse is for this kind of triangle. It is root 50. Can you give me a simplified version of that? Not a decimal, but like an exact value. Mm -hmm. So how many so we have five squared plus five squared. Okay, so Thea, you're using the Pythagorean theorem here, I think. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so another throwback, maybe we remember this a squared plus b squared equals c squared situation. And if we plug in 5 and 5, we'll get uh, 25 plus 25 equals c squared, and c equals square root of 50. But if we think about simplifying that, we could get 5 square root of 2. Everybody see how I got from 50 to 5 square root 2? So like 50 is 25 times 2, and so I just took the 25, I took the square root, and it got 5. So that means that this side is 5 square root 2. Okay. Now, for the sake of this question, it doesn't really matter which one is our angle, but let's pick this angle down here, okay? And if I asked you to find sine of theta for me, what would your ratio be? Yeah. opposite, which is 5, over the hypotenuse, which is 5 root 2. Okay. Um, can we simplify that a little bit? <gasps> yes, okay, first of all, how did you type the square root of 2, or the square root part? And then, why is your answer just the square root of 2? Because I'm going to say that's like the number one mistake there. The 5 cancel out, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with Eric that it's going to be 1 over the square root of 2, right? Sometimes we get so excited when things cancel out that we just forget that like one of those things is actually in the denominator. Yeah, so we got 1 over square root of 2. Okay, uh, you can actually, you can have a root in a denominator. Um, it's not that it's, yeah, I know, this is like the start of all the lies you were ever told in math. Um, <laughs> uh, you can. Some instructors, right, some instructors are more picky about it than others. Um, We'll talk about how we can easily go back and forth between having square roots in the bottom versus not. That's the more important skill to know how to go between the two rather than like always making sure it's one particular form. Um, so do you remember folks when we were in 116 and we had like uh, two over five minus three I, and I was like, oh, we can't have, imaginary numbers in the bottom. So we had to multiply by the complex conjugate. I don't look familiar. Okay, and then we ended up with a real number down here and that made us happy. Okay, so with radicals, it's kind of the same story where mathematicians don't really prefer to have the square root in the bottom, but it's not technically wrong it's just that it's, it's good to know how to sort of switch back and forth, okay? <laughs> All right, so for the purpose of this problem, we're just gonna leave the square root on the bottom because I'm more worried about what's the same and what's different versus can we simplify every little thing, okay? So we have our sine. What is our cosine for this theta? So cosine, we're looking at 
Yeah, adjacent, which happens to be the same as the opposite over the hypotenuse. And we can reduce again. And let's reduce correctly, and we get one over root two. Okay. Uh, and then last but not least, what is tangent of theta? Oh, there's Richard. Hi, Richard. Welcome back. All right, so how do we get our tangent theta? That would be the opposite side over the adjacent side. So five over five, and that gives us one, right? Okay, not too hard. A good practice for figuring out sine, cosine, and tangent. So let's go over to the pink triangle for a moment. And let's say that this pink triangle is also a right isosceles triangle. Oh, you're fine. I was just picking on you again. Don't worry about it. <laughs> OK, so let's say we had this smaller triangle and that the sides of this triangle were 2 and 2. What does that make the hypotenuse for this triangle? And you can use the Pythagorean theorem to help you figure that out. Okay, square root of four plus four. So it's square root of Eight, and what can we simplify that to if we were to sort of reduce our radical? Yeah, we get two root two. Okay, because again, the four, I can square root that exactly. Four times two, the four I can square root, that's how I get the two on the outside. And so my hypotenuse is two root two. And let's say for argument's sake that we have our theta in the same place again. And let's find sine theta, cosine theta, and tangent theta. So I'll give you a moment to write those out. What's your sine theta? What's your cosine theta? What's your tangent theta? And then if you can simplify the same way we did with the purple triangle, go ahead and do that. Right, anyone get an answer for sine of theta? What's the unsimplified ratio that we get here? Yes, it does. Two over two square root two. And yes, just like the one in the purple, we can reduce and oh, we get the same answer. Okay. Um, we should have gotten two over two root two for cosine and found that the twos cancel out again and we get one over root two for the cosine. 
And then for tangent, we should get two over two, which reduced to give us one. Okay. Any questions so far? Again, some good practicing in terms of finding sine, cosine, and tangent. Okay. Let's do one last one with the one in the blue. So this time, let's say I've got an isosceles right triangle, but this time the side lengths are nine and nine. Okay. How big is the hypotenuse? Well, I could use Pythagorean theorem, or I might try and be a little sneaky and think about patterns I see, like this number and this number is the same as the number in the plus. So it's like two, two, two squared and two. This one is like five, five, five square root of two. So, Maybe we could say then this hypotenuse is of the nine, nine, it'd be nine square root of two. Yeah, good, okay. So I think students always ask like, do I have to memorize these patterns? And the reality is you don't have to memorize anything, but I think it makes computations a lot easier. I think it gives you more brain space to focus on the bigger patterns rather than doing Pythagorean theorem every single time, okay? Now let's sort of run through our sine, cosine, and tangent over here. Sine, I should get, if this is my theta, nine over nine root two, which gives me one over root two. Cosine theta would be nine over nine root two, which reduces to one over root two and tangent theta equals nine over nine or equals one. Right, and again, a lot of those nines reduced, which is why we're able to get those numbers, okay? Now, how big is theta? Hmm. Ethan, how do you know that that theta is 45 degrees? You're right. Okay, because the sides are the same, so one angle is 90 degrees, yeah. And so I think a lot of us had learned at some point that there's sort of these special right triangles, 45, 45, 90, okay? And when we think about these triangles, we know that all the angles are the same, right? Like the pink theta is 45 degrees. The purple theta is 45 degrees. The blue theta is 45 degrees, okay? But I don't think any of you would sit here and tell me that the pink triangle is the same size as the purple triangle and the same size as the blue triangle, right? They're clearly different size triangles and we have sort of these numbers and our perspective to see that like they're different sizes, okay? So why is it that if you go to your calculator and you type in tangent of 45 degrees, your calculator will tell you that's one, but it doesn't know what triangle you're talking about. Okay, so kind of to Eric's question earlier, let me actually scroll up again. It was a really good question. Um, okay, so the question earlier says, when you use sign on a calculator on some number, how does it know what the hypotenuse and opposite are since you aren't providing a triangle? Okay, so we could almost ask ourselves the same question here. If we type in tangent of 45, how does our calculator know that's always going to be one? 
Well, that's the beauty of the idea of the ratio, okay? The ratio means we're dividing two things. Right, exactly. We're looking for if the simplified ratio is the same, then the actual length of the sides doesn't really matter. Okay? So we've picked nice whole numbers here. Two, 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 root two. Five, 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 root two. Nine, 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 root two. But check this out. Every single one of them has a tangent of one. It didn't matter how small or big our triangle was. Now, similarly, if you type in cosine of 45 degrees, okay, so let's see what we get. We get cosine of 45 degrees. We should get about 0 0.707. Is that what folks are getting? Oh, yes, perfect, thank you. Now, go ahead and type in 1 divided by root 2 on your calculator. You should get 0.707. Okay? What that means is that as long as your angle is 45 degrees, it doesn't matter how long the sides are, but that angle will always have a ratio of adjacent over hypotenuse, that is 0 0.707. These are all the same. Doesn't matter, small triangle, medium triangle, big triangle. If the angle is 45 degrees, the cosine will be 0 0.707 every single time. And last but not least, if you type in sine 45 degrees, you should get 0 0.707 again, which means that sine of 45 degrees doesn't matter whether that 45 degrees is in a small triangle, a big triangle, or an even bigger triangle, that ratio of opposite over hypotenuse is always going to be 0 0.7. Okay, so Isis, great question. What does each ratio describe? Well, let's kind of scroll back up for a moment. Each ratio describes some combination of the two of two of the three sides in the triangle. So if someone says, I want you to compare the opposite to the hypotenuse side, they're really saying, I want you to find sine of theta. Right? They tell you opposite and hypotenuse, you're thinking sine. If someone says, I would like you to compare opposite and adjacent, they're really telling you to look for tangent. Or if someone says, what's the adjacent side and the hypotenuse side? They're asking you to compare adjacent and hypotenuse, then that means they're asking you to look for the cosine ratio. Um, Isis, does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, and Eric, yeah, if you have the angle, you can use the ratio to find the length. And if you have the length, you can use the ratio to find the angle. Exactly. That's, in a nutshell, what we're learning in chapter five. Okay. Ah, okay, great question. So Christina says, do the decimals that we found, they, are they the length? And the answer to that is no, they're not the lengths, but they're the ratio of the length. Okay, so we could change that statement and say the decimal values found using a, cal using a calculator are the, the ratio of the side length. Does that make sense? Exactly, right? And so ratio, we don't want to get too caught up in like that. We want to think, whoa, ratio. 
Um, I think that some of us maybe don't like rational functions so much, but remember rational functions we learned in 116 were the dividing one polynomial by another polynomial. So that idea of ratio definitely comes up a lot when we're comparing two things using division. All right. So what I'd like us to take a little bit of time doing is we just did this for some 45, 45, 90 triangles, okay? And what I'd like to have you all do is I'm going to put you in some breakout rooms and we're going to try the same kind of pattern, but we're going to be looking at not isosceles right triangles, okay? We're going to be looking at another special case of right triangles. And in this case, we're gonna, one thing we're gonna keep the same is all our thetas will be in this bottom left-hand corner, okay? But let me give you some side lengths, and then you're gonna, in your breakout rooms, come up with the ratios that we have. And I would like you to simplify these ratios, keeping everything with radical, okay? So no, no decimal but we're going to keep everything as a radical. So I'm going to give you the middle triangle. I'm going to tell you that the middle triangle has a bottom side of, you know, an opposite side of four, a bottom side of four root three, and a hypotenuse of And so in your groups, what you're gonna do is you're gonna find your sine theta, you're gonna find your cosine theta, and you're gonna find your tangent theta. Set it up so that it's not reduced, and then you're gonna reduce it, but keeping everything with that. Once you and your group are done with the purple one, I want you to pick smaller numbers, but have the same ratio as the purple one for the pink triangle. And then I'd like you to scale your numbers up for the blue triangle so that you have larger numbers with the same ratios for the blue triangle. Does that make sense, folks? So I'm gonna throw you into some breakout rooms. And we'll take maybe about five to seven minutes to do that, okay? I feel, oh yes, okay, let me, let me do this. I'm gonna Stop sharing my screen. Okay, so I believe everyone has sharing privileges now. Sometimes Canvas changes things on me. So if it, I mean, sometimes Zoom changes things on me. So if it's not working, give me a holler and I'll be right there, okay? All right, I'll see you folks back here in about five to seven minutes. Again. Cool. Okay. So before I sent you in the breakout rooms, I was like, here's some numbers for this middle triangle, and I'd like you to set up the ratios for sine and cosine and tangent. And hopefully we got sine as one half after we reduced cosine as root three over two once we reduced, and tangent as one over root three before we reduced, or after we reduced, okay? And then I asked you in your breakout rooms to kind of create other triangles that had the same ratios. Um, so is there a group who'd like to volunteer their numbers for uh, the pink triangle, the small one? Uh, we 
just divided all of the numbers by two. Okay, so you got like a four, two, two root three. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, so then if you set up your sine theta, you would get two over four, which, check that out, is the same as the one from the purple triangle, right? And then cosine of theta would be two root three over four or root three over two. And then tangent theta was two over two root three or one over root three. Okay. So we can start to see that once we simplify, the sign for the pink triangle is the same as the sign in the purple triangle. And um, what numbers did groups use for the blue triangle? Alt option plus V. Okay, so everybody multiplied by two, okay. So then we got like 16, we got eight and eight root three, all right. And then hopefully we found that whatever our side lengths were, once we reduced, the ratio of the opposite and the hypotenuse was one half for every single one of these triangles, okay? And if we did the same thing for cosine, we got adjacent over hypotenuse or root three over two. And if we did for tangent, we got eight over eight root three, which was one over root three, okay? And so all the tangents at the end became the same once we reduced. All the cosines became the same, all the signs became the same, all right? Um, now, this one is not 45, 45, 90 triangle, but this triangle is rather a 30, 60, 90 triangle, okay? So all three of these triangles are 30, 60, 90 triangles. And so what we're seeing here is, I bet if you type in sine of 30 degrees, on your calculator, I bet you're all gonna get one half. And I bet if you type in cosine of 30 degrees, you're gonna get ooh, 0.866. Mm -hmm. And if you find tangent of 30 degrees, ooh, this one I don't know as well, one divided by root three. Oh yeah, 0.577, mm -hmm. okay. So these values, this is how we know. You don't have a triangle, you just tell your calculator sine of 30, it's always gonna be one half. It doesn't matter how big the triangle is. It could be the tiniest triangle in the world. It could be the largest triangle in the world with a 30 degree angle, and the sine of 30 would still be one half. All right, so before we go on break, I'd like to do one problem with some actual numbers in it, okay? I know that I sort of ask you a lot to think about these bigger picture questions, but at the same time, it's really important to bring it back to questions um, that also demonstrate that understanding, okay? So in example one, for this given right triangle, label the adjacent side, the opposite side, and the hypotenuse for the indicated angle. Then find the three main trig functions for alpha, okay? So we're diving deep into the Greek alphabet. This is alpha, all right? The lowercase alpha. I'm gonna draw it a couple times so we can just kind of see what it looks like. Um, mine kind of looks more like a fish uh, without the whole tail, so kind of like a, this situation, okay, or like part of an infinity. So if I do it one more time, kind of like this. Okay. So 
like those little fish that maybe you drew in elementary school, um, but it just doesn't have sort of the straight line at the end for the tail. Um, but that is the Greek letter alpha. And we also use alpha as a letter for ankles. And so we have our alpha right here. Okay. So the first part of the question says label the opposite, the adjacent, and the hypotenuse. So let's start with 17. How should we label 17? As the hypotenuse, good. Okay, what should we label eight? Okay, because if I look at theta, or my alpha rather, I look straight across, I get to eight. That means eight is the opposite side from alpha. Okay, and similarly, the hypotenuse is the opposite from the right angle. That's how we get it. Okay, the hypotenuse is always opposite the right angle. And then our 15 is usually the last one I label. Whatever's left over, that's our adjacent side. Okay. It's really important that we know how to label the different sides of the triangle as opposite, hypotenuse, and adjacent, because just like in our very first question, it kind of changes depending on where your angle is, okay? All right, so if I ask for sine of alpha, you should set up a ratio right away. And what is your numerator going to be for sine of alpha? Yeah, we have our opposite over the hypotenuse. So that's eight over 17, okay? And this just goes back to when we said the first part of SOHCAHTOA, S-O-H, okay? All right, what ratio do we get for cosine of alpha? Good, the adjacent over the hypotenuse, or no, 15 over 17, good. All right, and last but not least, what ratio do we get for tangent? You guys are on top of this. Opposite over adjacent, or eight over 15. Perfect, all right. So those are our three main trig functions for alpha, right? If you don't, if all of this stuff with the purple and the pink and the blue triangle didn't make sense, at the end of the day, what is important is that we're still able to answer questions like number one, okay? I think that the pink and purple and blue triangles help us understand more deeply what it is, but at the more surface level, we still wanna be able to find the sign, find the cosine and find the tangent given a right triangle, okay? So this seems like a good place to take a break. It is just about 10.50. So let's meet back here at 11 a.m. and we will start with the second part of class, okay? All right, folks, I'll see you back here in a little bit. All right, and so before the break, we were taking a look at SOHCAHTOA, and I feel like the signs, cosine, and tangent and stuff that a lot of people have seen before, so it's not necessarily new, um, but let's go ahead and fill those in uh, right here into our main trig functions, okay? So just to kind of get used to writing them again, we have sine theta is going to be, and we can abbreviate, it's going to be the opposite over the hypotenuse. Uh, cosine theta is going to be the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And tangent theta is going to be the opposite over the adjacent. Okay? And so we know all of those things. Um, and this first column is intentionally blank. Okay, so by the end of this um, section, we're gonna, not this section, but by the end of this unit, we're gonna figure out what goes in that left-hand column. 
But for right now, we're going to introduce three more trig functions, okay? And so let's kind of go um, draw a little triangle to just kind of root ourselves in this. Let's say we had a triangle that maybe looks something like this. It's definitely not right, but now it is, okay? So we've got a right triangle and let's call this angle theta right now. All right. And so if we were to label the opposite and the adjacent and the hypotenuse, this bottom side would be our opposite angle or opposite side. Our diagonal here would be the hypotenuse. And then the one next to theta would be the adjacent. I think we'd all agree with those. OK. Now, what does it mean to take a reciprocal? Can someone explain to me what a reciprocal is? Mm -hmm. Yep, I got you. So yeah, we just flip the fraction, right? The top becomes the bottom, the bottom becomes the top, okay? And so if we take opposite and hypotenuse and we find the reciprocal, then we end up getting hypotenuse over opposite, right? You guys agree that if I take the reciprocal of opposite over hypotenuse, I get hypotenuse over opposite. And if I take the reciprocal of adjacent over hypotenuse, I get hypotenuse over adjacent. And if I take the reciprocal of tangent or opposite over adjacent, I'll get adjacent over opposite. All right, that's the main idea behind these three other trig functions. So there's our main ones, the sine, cosine, and tangent. And then sometimes it's useful if we flip them. So we flip sine, we flip cosine, we flip tangent, all right? So we have hypotenuse over opposite, hypotenuse over adjacent, and adjacent over opposite. Now these three reciprocal functions, they have new name. And so what we need to do is, whoops, learn these new names, okay? Um, anybody know what the reciprocal of tangent is called? Yeah, the reciprocal of tangent is cotangent. And so we abbreviate that as C-O-T, C-O-T for cotangent, okay? So if someone says, what's the reciprocal of tangent? You all say cotangent. And all you do is we're flipping the ratio of our sides, okay? Um, anybody know the name for the reciprocal of cosine? So we have a new name. This one is called secant. And we abbreviate that S-E-C. Okay. And cosecant is exactly what Natalia said. Cosecant is our last reciprocal function, but that is the reciprocal function for sine is cosecant. And we abbreviate that, not COS. Why wouldn't we use COS for cosecant? Yeah, because we already have that for cosine. So we abbreviate it CSC, all right? So our CSC is our cosecant, all right? Yeah, yeah, 
there's definitely a lot of vocabulary here for sure. So if you have tricks on how to remember the different ones, definitely share those with each other. Um, well, Yitan, it might be interesting to kind of look up like all those different uh, trick functions. That's one of the math and writing prompts for this week is taking a look at uh, all the different trig functions that there are. Yeah, because there's like a bunch of hidden ones too, like versine and coversine and haversine. There's like a lot of them. Okay. Yeah. All right. So they really did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All in the context of a circle too. All right. So once upon a time, I think I was teaching this and someone was like, well, if there's a phrase for Sokotoa, then how come there's not one for the reciprocal trig function? So that's where this phrase comes from. C H O S H A C A O. Oops, is the last phrase. Okay, so this is from Once Upon a Time. I think I don't even remember what year this was, but um, I had some students that were like, "Let's come up with our own way of remembering the reciprocal trig functions," and they came up with Chosha Cow. That's it. Okay, so just like people have a right to make up things like SOKOTOA, you have a right to make up other acronyms that will help you remember things, all right? <laughs> yes, yes, mathematical revolution, I love it. Okay. So, like I said, we have the three main trig functions and then we have our reciprocal trig function. And then there's one last column that we're going to figure out at some point in the next few weeks, okay? Um, but just to kind of familiarize ourselves with the vocabulary, let's take a look at a triangle, a right triangle. And this time, our directions are defined the three main trig functions and three reciprocal trig functions for angle B, okay? Oh yeah, Euclidean geometry is only one type of geometry. There's like other types of geometry too. <laughs> Maybe Eric is the alternate ge geometry. All right, so we're looking for angle B, all right? So I'm gonna put that spotlight on angle B. And before we do anything, let's label opposite hypotenuse and adjacent, okay? So I think we can all tell that C is going to be our hypotenuse. I promise you that's not always the case, but it is often the case, all right? But unless they specify it or you see it in a picture, don't necessarily jump to that conclusion. Um, all right, which side is opposite of angle B? Little b, yay. All right, which makes our little a the adjacent side. Okay. So now that we have our three sides labeled, um, let's also look at what other information we're given in the problem. So they tell us for the given right triangle, let little c equal 13 and little b equal 5. So I know that little b is 5 and little c is 13. Okay. So let's go ahead and set up our six trig function, all right? So when I am answering a question like this, I tend to just write all the ratios out before I fill in any of the numbers. You do not have to do this. Okay, so we've got our sine, cosine, tangent. The reciprocal of sine is? Cosecant, there you go. Cosecant of B, that's gonna be a fraction. The reciprocal of cosine is sine, or secant, sorry, secant. And the reciprocal of tangent is cotangent. All right. 
Okay, so let's start off with sine. Sine of b is going to be 5 over 13. Do we agree with that? Sine of b would be 5 over 13. Yeah, we have our opposite side over our hypotenuse. Okay, if we know sine, what do we also know? We also know cosecant, right? So easy, all we do is flip the top and the bottom. Done. Okay, um, cosine, what do we get for the ratio of cosine? A over 13. Okay, I love that we know the 13's on the bottom. I know we need an A. Let's find a number for A, okay? So if you have two of the three sides in your right triangle, you should be able to find the third side, right? And you can find that third side in a number of ways. Let's use, I think someone earlier had done the Pythagorean theorem, okay? So if we use the Pythagorean theorem, Is this correct? Five squared plus 13 squared equals B squared. No, right? This is not correct. It is one of the most common mistakes. Sometimes people just say, I have two numbers. I don't know. Let me put them on the left-hand side together. Okay, but we do have to be really careful and say, all right, I know that we have five squared plus B squared equals the longest side squared, okay? And so if we use our calculator here, we'll get 25 plus B squared equals 169, B squared equals 144, B equals plus or minus 12, okay? There's technically a plus or minus 12 every time you take a square root, but since we're looking at side lengths of a triangle, we know it's gonna be the positive one, right? We don't need to say negative because we don't have a negative side. Uh, um, yes and no, it's the longest side is always on the equal sign by itself. And then the other two the shorter sides are on the other side together. Okay. So we can actually replace A with 12. And so that would make the answer 12 over 13 instead of A over 13. Okay. So if you don't have one of the sides, find the missing side so that you can complete the ratio. All right. And if we have cosine, then we also have secant because we can just take that reciprocal. And then tangent is going to be opposite over adjacent or 5 over 12. And then we can just take the reciprocal for cotangent. All right? So this is one way that Pythagorean theorem that we can find the missing side. And it always works, okay? If you have a right triangle, if you have the right triangle, you can use Pythagorean theorem. But there are a few other special right triangles that are kind of worth knowing. So now we're going to talk about some special right triangles by side. So if I tell you one side is three and the other side is four, you all tell me the last side is. Five. Yeah, so three, four, five is a very common right triangle because it's actually very special that all three sides are going to be whole numbers. And since it's so special, there's like a few common cases that we tend to use a lot, okay? So three, four, five, 
could be dressed up as six, eight, ten. Right? How did I get six, eight, ten? Yeah, I just did times two, right? So when you look at a problem and someone is like three, four, five, and that's the one you know, that's great. But if they give you six and eight, you better say 10, right? Because it's just a extension of one of the special right triangle. All right, so this triangle, the one we have, five, 12, 13, is another common special right triangle. So if you know the hypotenuse is 13 and you know one of the sides is 12, you also know the third side is five, okay? Uh, anybody know any of the other nice Pythagorean triples? I think there's maybe one or two more that tend to show up. Uh, with sides, with sides. Right, so these don't tend to come up as often, but there is. Mm, so everything would be whole numbers though. That's what makes it the Pythagorean triple. Right. Yeah, so there is one that's like a seven, 24, 25, that's pretty common as well. And then I would say the last one is maybe like an 8, 15, 17, okay? But a lot of the times you'll see the three, four, five or some variation of it, okay? And you might see 5, 12, 13, or like I could multiply everything by two and be like 10, 24, 26. That would also be a Pythagorean triple, okay? I think the last two that I listed are probably not very common, um, not as common. So if you're like, ooh, which ones would be worth knowing? I think the 3, 4, 5 is worth knowing, and I think the 5, 12, 13 is worth knowing. All right, but the point of this question was to practice our cosecant, secant, and cotangent, all right? So does that make sense how we find cosecant, secant, and cotangent from our triangle or from our other trig functions? Is that something we feel confident on? Okay. All right. So let's take a look at some variations of this question, okay? So <clears throat> let's assume that C is the right triangle. And what I'd like us to do is to solve a given triangle, all right? So solve the triangle that has sine B equals one over root three and A equals two. And so what we're gonna start off here is uh, with a diagram, okay? So if they give you a problem that sort of has like a lot of words in it, I really like to try and bring it back to a diagram so I can see what kind of information I have. Okay. So I'm going to draw a right triangle. Oh, that's not too bad. Okay. And we know they tell us C is the right angle, so I can label that as C. And I don't know which one is A and which one is B, but it doesn't really matter as long as I label it appropriately. So I'm just gonna say, let's call A the top one and B the one on the right. And let's see what else we can label. Well, I know for sure that little A is two. So I'm gonna go ahead and label little A 
as two. Okay. Now, let's unpack this piece of information a little bit. Sine of B equals one over root three. So sine of B equals one over root three. Well, I know that this originally came from a ratio, specifically a ratio of opposite over hypotenuse, okay? But one over three is just one of the possible answers. It could have been two over two root three. It could have been 11 over 11 root three, right? I don't actually know which one of these cases it is. So here's what I cannot say. I cannot say that the opposite side is one and the hypotenuse is root three. But I can say that the ratio of those after I reduce it is one over root three. So here's what we're gonna do. Let's take a look at angle B and label our opposite our adjacent side and our hypotenuse, okay? Now, if I know that the opposite side over the hypotenuse is one over root three, what I can say is that the opposite side of B is like one X because it's one times some factor. But the hypotenuse is not just root three, it's actually root three times x, like that same ratio piece, okay? I don't know what the x is yet, but if I find out what the X is, then I can solve this triangle because I'll know how long every single side in the triangle is, okay? So, we know once we have three sides that we can always go back to this idea of A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And we can always go back to the Pythagorean theorem to help us with three sides of a triangle. So what can I plug in for little a? Well, the question gave me a value, right? It gave me two. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug in two for little a. What can I plug in for little b? Yeah, I can plug in one X or I can call it X. So let's go with X squared. And what can I plug in for little c? Ooh, everyone should know how to type in a square root now. How do we, how do we uh, what do we put in for a little c? Yeah, square root of three. Well, we wanna do square root of three times x. So we got to take this whole thing and plug it in for c. So square root of 3x squared. Okay. Now let's do the boring part. Setup is the important part. Now we're just working through the, the computation. So 4 plus x squared equals, let's see, square root of 3 squared is 3x squared. All right, I'm gonna move my x squareds to one side. Four equals two x squared. I'm gonna divide both sides by two. Two equals x squared. 
and I get x equals plus or minus the square root of t. I don't need the minus one. I only need the plus one because I'm looking at the ratio of sides. So here's what this tells me. It tells me that little a is two. Little b is one x, or we found x to be square root of two, so little b is the square root of two. Little c is square root of three times x, or square root of three times square root of two, which is root six. And that is solving the triangle because I found the length of all three sides in my right triangle. Questions? I feel like this is a tough concept to grasp for folks. So are there any questions out there? The two root three. Well, like this part. Oh, 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 this part. Yeah, okay. For sure. So, um, this was just an example. Like, I don't know, just because this is the ratio, I don't know that the opposite side is one and then the hypotenuse is root three. I know it's some sort of ratio. So if I multiply the top and bottom by two, I would get two over two root three. If I multiply the top and bottom by 11, these were just like examples, very random examples, right? So they don't actually have to do with the problem, but what they do tell us is we have a lot of possible answers. Yeah, that's okay, that's okay. Let's write that down. Examples of possible answers. Okay. If we were not given sign, we would still know A is labeled on that side because it is the, it's opposite from angle A. Yes, that is correct. Mm -hmm. All right, um, let's try this one. Okay, so we've got a triangle situation again. Um, C is the right angle on this one. Again, that is typically how we do it, but we want to make sure that we're, it, the problem explicitly says that C is the right angle. And then now we're given some new information. Tangent A equals five over 12 and little b equals six. So let me give you a moment to draw a diagram that reflects that. Okay, so maybe we'll call that your step one is draw and label diagram. Okay. So take a moment to, Draw and label a diagram, and then we'll unpack the information we have. So it doesn't matter how you like which direction you draw your triangle. 
I tend to mix it up a lot just because I want us to get used to seeing them in different orientations. Um, but if you want to draw your triangle in the same way every time, that's also fine, okay? So looking at this, the one piece of information I can write down is that little b is six. So across from b, I can say that that's six. <clears throat> And then let's unpack this tangent A equals 5 over 12. So tangent A is 5 over 12 means that the ratio of the opposite to the adjacent is 5 over 12. But what this does not say is that the opposite is 5 and the adjacent is 12. So maybe like the other question, what could be another possible answer for side lengths if the ratio is 5 over 12? Um, maybe give me like another fraction that simplifies to 5 over 12. I think maybe that's a better way of asking. Yeah, yeah. So like it could have been 10 over 24 and then we reduced it to 5 over 12, right? That's a possible answer. Or maybe I did something like, uh, 15 over 36, that's another possible answer, right? These are all possible answers for my triangle, but I don't know which one it is, okay? All I know is that I have one side, which is a five ratio to 12 ratio of the other side. So if I go to angle A, because that's the angle that we're highlighting this time, I know that the opposite from A is over here, the hypotenuse is over here, and the adjacent is down here. So I know for the opposite side, I could say that little a equals 5x. So the x is the part that helps us figure out which one of these possible answers it's going to be. Um, what could I call little c? Mm, little c, not little a. Yeah, um, 12. Yeah, Wait. yeah. <laughs> okay, so we've got 5x and we've got 12x. And so now we can use our Pythagorean theorem, just like we did in the last one, plug things in and find our x value. So maybe instead of just saying Pythagorean theorem, let's say um, find x using Pythagorean. Okay, because we're sort of putting in our instructions first, like what we're trying to do, and then, oh, sorry, C is not 12X, what am I doing? Ah. B is 12X, right? Okay, let me just kind of pause for a moment. So, back it up. Opposite is this opposite. And then we know that it's the ratio of like five, five x. Okay. And then our adjacent is like 12, and that's our adjacent is like the ratio of 12.
So our goal in this next step is to find X, right? Yeah, X is your scaling factor, okay? X is like, are you doubling everything? Are you tripling everything? Are you cutting things in thirds or in quarters? Like, what are you doing to scale that triangle, right? It's almost like if you think back to earlier, do you have the pink triangle, the purple one, or the blue one, right? Which size triangle do you have? And so the X is what helps us figure out which size triangle we have, okay? Um, but let's go back to the chat for a moment. Um, Yitan said that you could do 6 over 12. Do you mean 6 over... I think I'm a little confused what you mean in that. I'm just doing uh, what you said, basically. I'm finding the ratio of scaling between um, the triangle that the tangent would give me and the triangle that B is giving me, and then I'm using that to find the value of five. Perfect. Yeah. So X is the scaling factor, but um, as Yitan and Richard pointed out, there's actually an overlap with what we know and what we're trying to find, okay? So our goal is to find X in the easiest way possible. And for the last problem, we were sort of forced to use Pythagorean theorem, but that's not always gonna be true in every case. There might be shorter ways of finding what you need to find, okay? So for example, let's look at this part that's right there. From my labeling, I know that 6 equals 12x. So if I wanted to find x, I know that x is 6 over 12 or 1 half. Okay. So what this means is that my triangle is scaled by like 1 half, right? So it's almost like the pink triangle, like smaller than sort of an original triangle, okay? But what that allows us to do is if we know the scaling factor, then we know how long the opposite side is. So A is 5X. Well, everywhere we see the x, we can put in a one half, and we know that a is five. Okay. So it turns out that a wasn't 10 or 15, like we had guessed in our possible answers. It was actually some fraction of our original guess. Now, once you have A and you have B, how do we find the third side in our triangle? Let me ask that question one more time. We've got two sides of a triangle. How do we find that third side? Yeah, two sides of a right triangle, you can 100% use the Pythagorean theorem. So, to find C, we're gonna use the Pythagorean theorem. We're gonna use the numbers that we know so far. So for A, we can do five halves squared, plus B is gonna be six squared, and that's gonna give us our hypotenuse squared. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, exactly. You could do that as well, right? So there are multiple ways to approach any given problem, which for some of us is like really exciting. And for some of us is like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so I'm sure there's a lot of mixed feelings right now, but there are multiple ways to think through a problem. All right, so now this setup is the sort of important part. After this, it's all just kind of like number crunching. So we've got 25 over four plus 36 equals C squared. So C squared equals, I think this is 169 over four, which gives us C equals plus or minus 13 over two. Um, we know that it's going to be the positive version because we're looking at side length. Okay? But we want to make sure we're sort of setting that good precedent that we know every time we take a square root, we've got a plus or minus. All right, so there's that whole problem on one page, or one screen rather. All right, so the, the method is a little different from three. But we really want to think about like how do we use all the tools we know in a flexible way to get to the answer. Um, how did I get 169? I turned 36 into a fraction over 4. I think that's 144 over 4. And then I added my fraction. So 25 plus 144 is 169. All right, so let's move on. I feel like my computer feels like my brain this morning. Okay, here we go. All right, so <clears throat> we're going to take a look at something called co function identity. Okay, so this is the start to a list of identities. There are many, many identities in trig. And basically what an identity is, is something that's always going to be true. Okay. So like sine equals opposite over hypotenuse is always going to be true. And so what we're doing now is just kind of extending this a little bit. All right. And so what I'd like to do is this. Um, let's call on the left hand triangle, we're going to call this uh, little a, we'll call this little b because it's opposite beta. So beta is another Greek letter used to talk about angles, right? So alpha and beta. Um, and then we'll call this hypotenuse c. And we're actually going to label the same, the other triangles the same way, A, B, and C, okay? And what I'm going to have you do in breakout rooms real quick is do this. You're going to take a look at what happens when you're looking at angle alpha, right, in the left-hand triangle. And then you're going to take a look at what happens for angle beta in the right-hand triangle, okay? And what I want you to do is for each one, I want you to write out the six trig function. So find sine of alpha, blah, 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 all of them for alpha. And then I want you to do the same thing for beta sine, sine, theta, find all, all six trick functions. Does that make sense? So what you're going to do is in your breakout rooms, you're going to fill out all of that information. Okay, you're going to leave them as ratios. You're going to have a lot of letters. Okay, and that's okay. Then this next question I want you to think about, which is how do you want to organize this information? Meaning what kind of patterns do you see about things that are the same or things that are different? Okay. And I want you to try and write down some of these things that are the same. Okay. 
So just to reiterate, you're going to take a look at these two triangles. You're going to write all six trig functions for alpha, all six trig functions for beta. And then I want you to think about what's the same between these two. Look for patterns that are the same between alpha and beta. OK? Make sense? All right. So how much time do you think we need to do that? Five minutes? Yeah. Okay. Let's take about five minutes and do that. And then I will see you folks back here in a little bit. All right, we'll give folks just a little bit longer to pop back into the room. I realize that's a feature I don't really love about the breakout rooms. I feel like it's hard for me to know how you're doing or if you need more time. So I'll try and think of a creative method around that. All right. Looks like pretty much everyone made it back in. Um, so how did it go? Were you able to get things that sort of look like what I have filled in on the page right here for all the ratios? Yeah, okay. So hopefully the ratios at this point are getting a little bit more uh, routine for you. I know there's a lot of vocabulary and it's just part of why I didn't fill in all like the um, things for you is I want us to kind of practice writing them. Um, and yes, we're actually gonna use colors right now to kind of see what's the same and what's different, okay? So what is one um thing that people found was the same between the things for alpha and the things for beta so i see a whole lot of letters right we we don't even have like numbers here at this point like this is how you know you're in like a serious math class like, all the numbers just kind of disappeared right but if we're looking at the ratios are any of the ratios okay so the hypotenuse is the same for for both triangles or for both um angle a and angle b exactly okay what about the ratios ah richard tell us what you uh, found The cosines and cosecant. Okay, so the cosine of alpha. Let me let's start there. The cosine of alpha is B over C. And you said that's the same as the sine of beta. Okay, so sine of beta is B over C. Yeah, they both look like they're B over C, right? Okay, and let's see, Eric, what did you point out? You said that tangent is the reciprocal of each other, right? Tangent alpha is the reciprocal of tangent beta, but what is tangent alpha equal to then? If we were to pick like a matching one on the other side, what is tangent alpha the same as for beta? Yeah. 
cotangent, yeah. Okay. So I don't know how many of you ever played that game memory when you were younger, right? You get like a bunch of uh, flashcards and, or, you know, cards, they have like pictures on them or they have words on them, but you're just trying to match them, right? Which ones are the same? So that's effectively what we're doing right here. So we found the pink pair. We have this light purple pair. Um, what about, what other pairs can we find that are the same here? Any other pairs or is that it? Cosecant alpha is C over A and secant of B. Oh yeah, that's C over A too, good. All right, so we found three pairs. What else? Sine of alpha is A over C and oh yeah, cosine of beta is A over C. Huh, interesting. Cotangent alpha is the same as tangent beta. Good. And then does it work out? Is this last pair the same too? Secant alpha. Yeah, that's the same as cosecant beta. Whoa. All right. So one of the prompts about for the math and writing assignment was to kind of like take a look at proofs and different types of proofs. And I think sometimes when we think about proofs, we're like, it just seems so like long and boring, or there's like a lot of letters or notation that we don't really understand. But what we're kind of building here is we're looking at a very general case because I didn't give you numbers for A, B, and C. I just gave you the idea of, the side across from alpha, the side across from beta, the side across from the right angle. And we just called them A, B, and C. And we combine that with the idea of what sine, cosine, all that stuff means, and we were able to come up with a general theme, okay? And so if we started to unpack this a little bit more, what we'd find is we could write out maybe like sine alpha, equals cosine beta, right? That would be sort of this, gosh, I can't even remember what colors we used. This one maybe, right? Sine alpha is equal to cosine beta. Can we say that cosine alpha equals sine beta? Well, yeah, that was like the hot pink pair, right? Sine alpha equals cosine, or cosine alpha equals sine beta. Okay. Um, let's go back up to the triangle for a moment. How big is angle C? Like what's the measure of angle C? Mm -hmm. You bet it is, it's 90 degree angle, okay. okay. If C equals 90 degrees, what does alpha plus beta equal? Like, if one of the angles is 90 degrees, how much do the other two added together make? 90 degrees. All right. So if alpha and beta equal 90 degrees, what that means is alpha and beta oh, are complementary. Angle. You guys remember that word from geometry like a long time ago, complementary angles? 
the complementary angles add up to 90 degrees, okay? Complementary starts with CO. So it turns out that if two angles are complementary to each other, like A and B are complementary because they add to 90 degrees, if two angles are complementary to each other, then we can identify some co-function, okay? No, that doesn't mean that A equals B. It means that like if alpha was 60 degrees, what would beta equal? It'd be 30, right? And so maybe how we get there is 90 minus 60 or 30, okay? What if alpha was 40 degrees? How big is beta? Yeah, 90 minus 40 or be 50 degrees, okay? So complementary means together they add up to 90, but one of them could be like one, the other could be 89. Those would still be complementary angles, okay? So let's check this out for a moment. If you have complementary angles, okay, we know that A, alpha, and beta, they add up to 90 degrees. So another way that I can write this statement is sine of alpha equals cosine of, instead of writing beta, I'm going to write 90 minus alpha. Okay, let's pause here for a moment. Why am I writing 90 minus alpha instead of beta? Like how come I can just replace that? Yeah, because, because alpha and beta equal 90, when I add them, 90 minus alpha is going to give me beta. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Now, we don't typically use alpha in our definitions. I think we tend to use either x or theta. And so for that reason, the way you'll see it in a textbook is usually something like this. Sine of theta equals cosine of 90 minus theta. Okay. Now, if I have a 90 in there, am I measuring my angle in degrees or radians? Okay, if I have a 90 in there, I'm measuring by degrees. So this equation is true for degrees. How would I modify this equation so that I could use this if I was looking for an angle in radian? Like let's say theta's in radian. Ah, so close, not the quarter pi, but we're looking at a half pi, okay? So instead of cosine of 90 minus theta, I could write pi over two minus theta. And this one would give me the radian version. So when you're thinking about, oh, you look at so many different, um, like if you look up the equation for a co-function, some resources might say 90 minus theta, some of them might say pi over 2 minus theta, but it's the same thing. It's just that one of them is for degrees. So if your question's in degrees, you want to use that one. But if your question's in radians, then you want to use the other one, okay? So cosine and sine are co-functions. We could write this 
hot pink one as cosine theta equals sine of 90 minus theta or sine of pi over 2 minus theta. Okay. And so for every pair that we found above, the green pair, the blue pair, the yellow pair, the purple pair, all of those are co-function pairs. And you'll kind of notice the names kind of tell you they're going to be co-functions, like sine and cosine, secant and cosecant tangent and cotangent, okay? So for each one of these pairs, we could write out the co-function identity, right? Now I'm gonna do, let's do one more of these and then I'm gonna leave the other three for you to write down, right? I'm going to start asking you this question a lot. How do you want to organize this information? Okay. We can have grids. We can organize by color. We all sort of have things that we lean towards in terms of things making sense for us. And I really want us to engage in that process as we're taking these notes. Okay. We're not just sitting in front of the screen, listening to some lady ramble about math, but we're also being active in this process about like, how do we organize this for our brains? Okay. So let's write down one more co-function identity. I could do the yellow pair, okay? So I can say that cotangent of alpha equals tangent of beta, which means that cotangent of alpha equals tangent of 90 minus alpha. And then in our general form, we could write cotangent theta equals tangent of 90 minus theta, or we know that 90 and, two, and pi over 2 are the same, so we could interchange them, okay? So this one is for that yellow pair. So again, after class, take some time to look at the green pair, the blue pair, and the purple pair, and think about how you write the co-function identities for them. Okay. All right. Well, this is all fine and good, but like, what is the co-function identity important for? Okay. And so we can use it in this context right here, where we're trying to think. Okay, if I know sine of fifty-four, how do I find out? what x is like there's some angle out there that if i take the cosine of that angle i'm going to get the same ratio as if i do sine of 54. okay what is that angle well let's write down our co-function identity and see so the co-function identity for sine says that sine of theta equals cosine of, should I write 90 or pi over two? Yeah, 90 minus theta. Okay. So what we're really saying here then is this X is the same as this 90 minus theta. Well, what's our theta in this case? 54 degrees. So cosine of 90 minus 54, whatever 90 minus 54 is, that's going to give us our x. So x equals 90 minus 54, or what is that? 36 degrees. Okay. And if you want to double check this, type into your calculator, sine of 54 degrees. What do you get? And then type in cosine of 36 degrees. What do you get? Whatever that decimal is, they better be the same. Okay? So these are some questions where it's not so bad to sort of check your answer. 
Right, right, exactly, exactly. So whatever these are, they should be the same, okay? All right, let's take a look at exercise number six. So cosecant of pi over three equals secant of x. Well, the co-function identity says that cosecant of theta equals secant of, this time I'm gonna use pi over two because I know I have the other side in radians, minus theta. Well, let's see how that works with the numbers. Cosecant theta equals secant of pi over two minus pi over three. Okay, well, that means that pi over two minus pi over three is gonna be equal to our x. And so I think when we do some common denominators, we should get pi over six as our answer, okay? A uh, quick question for you, how in the world do we type that into the calculator to check if our answers are right? You could convert to degrees, but actually, if you go to the mode button, this is more for the TIs, less for the Casios, um, but if you have a TI calculator, there should be a button that says mode, and one of the choices you'll have at some point, it'll say DEG for like degrees, or it will say RAD for radians. If you go to change it into the radian mode, then you could just type in pi over three and everything will be fine. Where do we find that on the calculator? Like, where do we find cosecant? I don't think it's in the mode. We do want to make sure we're in radians. Hmm. How do we just use sign for it? Uh, these are all super good questions. I'm so glad you're saying these. Okay, so cosecant, whoa, cosecant of an angle. That's the reciprocal of which angle or which ratio? Okay, one over sine theta. That's how you type it into the calculator, okay? I love that you said the other options, but it is not this. It's not this. Okay. We'll talk about what those minus ones are. That's what those minus ones are actually for that first column that we left blank. Uh, in the three column piece. Okay. So you're going to do sine of pi over six or pi over three, and then you do one divided by sine of pi over three. So one divided by sine of pi over three. Mm -hmm. In Desmos, there's actually a trig function. Um, I think it's worth practicing how you do it on your own calculator, just in case you ever have to do it in a class when you're not allowed to use Desmos, okay? Um, but yes, Desmos has it built right in. So if you have not downloaded the Desmos app on your phone like all the other cool kids, 
I would definitely recommend it because it's like a free calculator that has everything that you wanted to have on it. Okay. I know I love decimal too. Okay. So whatever you get for this should be the same as if you type in secant of pi over six. <laughs> All right, so secant of pi over six. Well, how do we type that into the calculator? Uh, Vanessa, you can always open the app, or not app, but you can always open desmos.com on your computer too, and that is also totally fine. Okay, so when you're doing your homeworks and quizzes and stuff, you can use that. Right. So if we're looking for secant, then we're going to use the idea that is the reciprocal of cosine to type in our answer. Okay. And whatever we get there should be the same as the cosecant pi over pi. All right. How are the brains doing out there? Yeah, I can tell. I know, I know. <laughs> All right, so let's do this. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. I'm going to.